Good, good evening. I'm going to first pass the, um, the greetings from uh, Bladder Cancer UK. I told them that I was coming here, and the, these are the sister organizations in the UK, and said they know Bladder Cancer Canada fairly well, recognize the work, and somehow got inspired by Bladder Cancer Canada on their own. So that was the first thing. The second thing that was very interesting is I attended, like many other neurologists, um, two large conferences in the last few weeks, but then I attended a bladder cancer meeting where groups who are the world, live it like you do, decide on, okay, we're going to fund that research, this is more important than this and this. And what actually struck me was that every single bladder cancer organization European was part of the discussion so that Patients at the forefront are directly involved, even when they do research, because patients and the families know firsthand what's important for them, not necessarily the physician. I found that really, kind of really, really uh, interesting. And last but not least, um, there is to, to address uh, Michelle's um, absolutely correct concern about blood cancer in younger men and women. Um, there is a large ongoing study of I think that Marie St. Pierre probably, I was, to be honest, uh, celebrating my granddaughter's fourth birthday, so I couldn't, couldn't attend the, the Black Cancer Forum. But um, she has presented the combined experience of Toronto, McGill, and Vancouver. And the reassuring thing is that we did not find that blood cancer is at least the non muscle invasive uh, type was more aggressive in younger ladies and men than we older. Very often you live with the idea that when a cancer affects someone who's young, it's going to be more aggressive. But here we were kind of reassured, even with a longer follow-up, to show that it isn't. So stay tuned, but it's definitely on top of our priorities. Peter Black, West Kirsch, and Cal, I'm sure uh, we were trying to address that. Good, so my task uh, tonight is to talk about the contemporary management of muscle invasive bladder cancer and to tell you that we've gone a long, long way and that one size does not fit all. The first thing, here are my disclosures, the classical disclosures of the pharma companies. But then the second disclosure, and I do this often, I'm actually not a medical oncologist, I'm not a radiation oncologist, although I'm going to be defending not removing bladders. I'm a surgeon and I call uh, an MIS, usually the MIS is for minimally invasive surgeon. Here, the joke is it's a maximally invasive, uh, invasive surgeon. And so just to get everybody back on board, as you know, bladder cancer is of basically two types. The one which is previously termed superficial or non-mass invasive that goes into the lining and the second layer, which is TA and T1. And then the one that becomes much more aggressive and unfortunately is potential life threatening and which affects the, the muscle or beyond the muscle or even adjacent organs. That's T2, T3, and T4. And so I'm gonna to concentrate today on muscle invasive bladder cancer, which actually comprises roughly 25 to 30% of people presenting up front, but which is truly the most life threatening sort, not that the non-muscle cannot evolve into something that can become life-threatening, but when right off the bat people are diagnosed with muscle-invasive bladder cancer, that's where you have to take things very, very seriously, and where most of the time it's going to be a multimodal treatment, surgery, radiation, and I'm going to annoy Kala all the time to uh, ask her to see, even when it's only uh, limited to the uh, muscle. Now, we, I think we should all, and again, I'm a surgeon who does a cystectomy nearly every week. I think we should be rethinking the idea that radical cystectomy is the only choice for patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer. Things have changed. I'm going to show you, convince, and I've, I've been con trying to convince many people that that's not the case anymore. Radical cystectomy has been, for a long, long period of time, considered as the gold standard where you remove the organ and the tumor. Part of the equation was due to the fact that the blood is a storage organ. Whatever will affect 
the bladder can affect many parts. And very often patients have, and you know it, when you have a bladder tumor, you have one on the dome, one on the lateral aspect, one on, on the leg. And so basically it's called multifocal. And therefore, in order to be able to control that disease as multifocal, up to fairly recently, we had no other solution than to remove the primary artery. And that's called a radical cystectomy. And why radical? Because it's clearly radical. In men, you have to remove the prostate. Why that? Not because we decide to remove the prostate, but because very often the bladder cancer will penetrate in 50 to 20% of the case into the prostate. So if you leave it in place, you basically will leave to her. And you also have to remove the seminal vesicles, the sexual nerves are intimately connected to the prostate. You can do sometimes what we call a nerve sparing procedure, but it's going to be radical because you remove a lot of organs which have a very important function and it would be completely stupid to say that it's not a life altering surgery. It is a life altering surgery, even if you replace it with a new bladder. In women, same thing. The bladder tumor very often are on the posterior wall. And so the cystectomy comprises of the removal of the bladder and also the anterior part of the, the vagina, because you see that that's your bladder. But if you have a tumor here, it's going to have a couple of millimeters until it goes into the vagina. And unless you have something very limited, one has to remove part of the vagina and therefore affecting as well the sexual function of, of, of ladies, which has been underreported, understudied, but which is definitely something that we need to pay attention uh, to. So it's radical. Now, there has been a paradigm shift in many cancer types towards what's called bladder preservation without having to remove the tumor and the entire organ out of the body. And that usually is combining a minimal resection of the tumor and adding chemo and radiation therapy. And that's called TNT, trimodal therapy. Now, in bladder cancer, TNT comprises the complete resection of the bladder tumor. And I can sense that many people in this audience have had that, where you go in, you resect everything, you scrape it completely, whatever you can see. And then in addition, then you're going to deliver radiotherapy, and I'll explain to you, on that area that was resected, plus a lower dose on the rest of the bladder and the nodes. And we're going to ask our colleagues, medical oncologists, Dr. Jiang or, or Dr. Sweeter, to give some chemotherapy to radio chemosensitize the cells to radiation. If you give a lower dose of chemotherapy, it's going to make your radiation treatment more effective. This, and I'll, I'll explain to you later, this is diff different from the systemic large neoadjuvant or, or, or chemotherapy, which is much more, more um, you know, intensive, so to speak. Now, who are the best candidates? I wish and we wish we could tell everyone in this audience that everyone is an ideal candidate when you have a tumor that is going to the bladder wall, into the muscle, to preserve the bladder by giving a combination of chemo radiotherapy. The reality is, unfortunately, that we're not there yet. I'm going to show you who can benefit, and I'll show you why we don't think that everyone can benefit from it. Usually, these are patients with one single tumor, less than three inches because you have to be able to scrape it completely so you see nothing left and without extensive carcinoma anxiety many people may have carcinoma anxiety there and there and there that's actually a surrogate for a genetic instability if you keep a bladder where there's disease everywhere the risk when you keep the bladder of something popping out, another tumor, is much, much higher than when you have one single tumor, no carcinoma inside. And then last but not least, no impact or minimal impact unilaterally on the kidney. So what we call hydronephrosis, the swelling of the kidney. And 
by definition, there's no point in keeping the bladder if your bladder function is poor to start with. You have to have a decent bladder function to, to keep it. Otherwise, it just totally makes no sense. And so a lot of studies have shown in the past that chemo radiation makes sense and provides good outcomes in selected patients. And I'll spare you that busy slide. But that busy slide is simply to show you that there was basically no comparative study between radical cystectomy and TNT. These were studies where you retrospective, you take this and I patients, you go back, you look at their outcomes, but it's not that you were really literally comparing to a, a radical cystectomy. Since 2008 officially, we have started a multidisciplinary bladder cancer clinic at your it's on, on the second floor of Toronto General. Although many people have had, as you know, the chance to, to meet Super Rhonda here uh, at, at Sana for uh, her treatments. And she's honestly part of it, although uh, not directly on the floor. And this clinic was meant to be able to offer various treatment options at the same time to patients and their families, where not one single option would be discussed, but various options. And you see all the, all the people involved, your oncologists, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists who are here uh, in, in, the, in, in the audience, clinic coordinators, PAs, uh, pathologists, and you name it. And the advantage was to simultaneously assess patients, have the discussion whether patients are eligible for one or the other treatment or both, present at the same time the options, the pros and the cons, and come up with a treatment decision where everyone is part of it, a true interdisciplinary. We were, and we are helped by the informatics. Uh, Mike Jewett, that maybe many of you remember, had started here the bladder cancer informatics system where at uh, the touch of a click, we have the full history of a patient without having to go back. Uh, everything was in green, means it was good. Everything in red, unfortunately, something was abnormal. Everything in yellow on, on the journey of the patient shows that we have to be careful. You have the last CISO that appears, you even have the pathology that appears. And that has been truly essential to improve and guide management. Now, with respect to the radiation therapy, I told you, you resect the tumor, you decide that the patient has a single tumor, doesn't go further than the muscle, is not accompanied by carcinoma inside, it has no impact on the kidneys. So this patient could be a candidate. What happens is that we bring back the patient to the system and we can inject at each of the quadrants of the crater where you spray the tumor, a small substance which is called lipidol. Why lipidol? Because you can see it on the CAT scan. And we all know our bladder can be distended and then less distended when we pee. And that means that when you're going to deliver high doses to kill every single cancer cell, what you want is to provide and come up with the biggest dose on that era without harming the others. And the way to track a little bit like when you, you send a missile, <laughs> it's GPS guidance. Here it's not GPS guidance, it's not a lipidol guidance. And that truly helps our colleagues from radiation oncology to deliver. They deliver the maximum dose on the bladder. They deliver a lower dose on the rest of focusing here. And they also do deliver on the nodes. And as you know, I, and I say that very often, bladder cancer, and especially muscle invasive bladder cancer, is made of two enemies. The enemy that you see, which is the tumor that you see, the casca that shows you something, and then the enemy that you don't see, those cells that can be somewhere sitting that absolutely no technique can detect up to now. And that's why so often we can send patients to Dr. Sridhar and Dr. Jiang to fight the enemy that you don't see at the same time as you fight the enemy that you see. Now, bladder preservation is fine, it's great, but comes with commitments. Commitments from the teams who are treating patients, commitments from the patient themselves. Because you keep the bladder in place, that means that you have a risk of other tumor coming out on the long run. And so you need 
stretching diligence starts with these every three months for the first three years, every six months for the first the next three years. And honestly speaking, lifelong. We haven't stopped. We officially started now 16 years ago, although the blood cancer clinic was, was actually present. And I've been scoping people for 20 years. And uh, I think we're going to continue simply because we don't know. And so it's not easy. It's not easy on the system. It's not easy on the patient. And it's part of the equation. It's part of the guidelines, absolutely. So bladder preservation now is part of many, many, many guidelines. And it's even part of the best current practice. That's the, the famous Lancet. You can read that paper. You can see that bladder preservation with trimodality therapy is absolutely part of the treatment. So you're going to say, okay, part of the guidelines, part of the recommendation, why don't we do it more? It's a very, very good question. Despite the growing, growing body of evidence that it works, TMT has been limited very often and restricted to patients for whom they were not good candidates for suspecting comorbidities and others. And maybe one of the possible reasons, although I'm not completely sure, was that we lacked comparative studies between cystectomy for exactly the same disease and trimodality when you keep the bio and you follow those patients. And in the absence of what we call randomized, so what is the best evidence? The best evidence in studies is when you randomly allocate patients to either one treatment or the other, it's completely random. And usually when you have inclusion criteria which you are well defined, people overall will have exactly the same kind of characteristics. I wish, we all wish that RCTs, randomized studies would be performed, but the three studies, SPARE in the UK, one in the San Antonio, another one in the States, all closed due to lack of accrual. And let's be realistic, we don't believe that there's going to be a randomized study in the, in the next 10 years. Various reasons, patient preferences, uh, physician preference, you name it. So it has been so difficult to accrue in the very fact that even the Brits were incredibly well organized and have a big, big blood preservation program were not able to carry on, tells us that it's really challenging. And so we were scratching our heads and said, okay, We've been doing this in Toronto, a little bit at, in Boston Harbor, a couple of centers worldwide. Still, people don't do it. Can we do something to change the management? Can we do something to change maybe, maybe the minds? And this is why, in the absence of randomized study, together with all the teams, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, surgeons, and partnering with a large center for blood preservation, which is the Mass General, with Jason F. a good friend of mine, radiation oncologist in Boston, and Zia Danishman in, at USCLA, well-known and absolutely uh, fantastic surgeon, we decided to try to get, in the absence of a randomized study, the best evidence we could to show that the two treatments are equivalent. And that's the paper that was published with several people, including Calgary, uh, in the lens of oncology of cancer. And to do so, what we did was to take about 722 patients with muscle invasive, same criteria as I described, clinical T2, muscle invasive, limited, less than seven centimeter, no carcinoma inside, who treated between 2005 and 2017. And absolutely all the patients that were included in this trial actually could have been eligible either to have the blood removed or the TMT. It's not that we chose randomly one or that. We really took people who could have been eligible and candidates for, for both. And I will spare you the way that statistically we did it, and it was thanks to Catherine and the statisticians, Andres and at Harvard. We use a trick, statistical trick, which is two methods to mimic equivalent group. One is propensity score matching, and the other one is IPT2W, reverse probability treatment weighting, which are established matters when you have different groups where you can't 
compare apples and oranges. And you really want to compare oranges with oranges. And you, we use quite a lot of several variables um, to, to analyze the endpoints. Now, the first thing that everyone will ask, okay, you took those 700 patients, but what is the proportion of all patients with a unifocal tumor, no CIS, and blah, blah, blah? Roughly 30% of people with muscle invasive bladder cancer fulfill those criteria. So the first thing is that unfortunately, 70% or 65% do not. It's still great to offer something else than radical cystectomy for proportion of those patients, but it's completely beyond reasonable to say that that, that necessity applies to all patients. It's a subset of people who could benefit. And I won't go really into the, the nitty gritty of the details, but what you can see is that before what we call the matching of the two cords, you can see that the red and the green dots don't superimpose. The two groups are different. Once you use this trick of bringing them together and matching them, you see that the two curves are superimposable. That's when you can really start basically comparing curves. And the first question we had is, what is the proportion of men and women who will present during follow-up with disease outside of the bladder, where the disease escaped, then seven free survival? And whether you use one or the other statistical method, you see that the two curves are exactly, exactly, exactly the same. No difference. And then you're going to say for cancer-specific survival, so it's slightly different, exactly the same, whatever technique you use, exactly, exactly the same. In terms of overall survival, there has been quite a lot of discussion, even in tweets, and in, actually the bladder preservation did slightly better. Many of us, including me, think it's pure chance in the first year of the patients treated with TMT, there was absolutely no fatality outside of anything. In the age group, which was way above 17, where unfortunately, statistically speaking, one or two people will have you know, heart attack, name it, no one died, which is great. And that likely is, is causing this difference. One more we can fully exclude that there's a real difference, but we, we don't believe that. Now, another question that one can reasonably ask is, very often, when patients will have a radical cystectomy, we're going to send them to our colleagues, medical oncologists, to give chemotherapy to fight the enemy that you don't see. And so what happens when you compare patients who have received chemotherapy with radical cystectomy versus patients who have received chemotherapy to radiosensitize it and then radiation? Again, absolutely, absolutely no difference. And then what is important to mention, I'll, I'll get back a little, little bit in a couple of minutes. You keep the bladder, which means that by definition, you are at risk of having another tumor popping out in that bladder as you kept it. 13% of men and women in this study actually ended up having a recurrence that was aggressive and prompted a radical system, which we now call a salvage. And so everybody has to understand that the equivalence in treatment is pending that 13% still ended up having a cystectomy. And in medical science and statistics, it's what we call an intent to treat. If you were initially in the group treated by radical preservation, even if you had a salvage cystectomy, you will be accounted as radical preservation. And so the equivalence takes into account the fact that 13% have to be operated. Now, the silver lining here is that you can see the two curves. Patients who have salvage cystectomy, if you pull the trigger fast enough to remove the bladder when you should because the tumor came back, the outcome is exactly the exactly. same. Now, a second question would be, okay, but are there differences? Is it that one center is driving the results, Toronto or Boston or LA? 
what you can see here is, and again, very reassuring for our health system, whether you're operated or treated in Toronto, in Boston or Harvard or USC, you have exactly, exactly, exactly the same resource. No difference, irrespective, with the caveat again, that all these centers are expert centers, no doubt about that, but there's no difference. So as I told you, about 13% had to have a salvage cystectomy, but because you keep the bladder, another 20% will have non-invasive, sometimes even low-grade recurrences. And so that's why we have to follow those patients uh, on the lifeline. What also made the study very, very powerful was that our survival rate, even with radical cystectomy, you can see it, above 80% in five years, was at the upper, upper range of what has been published in that disease. With 1% of positive margin, 39 nodes removed, which is a surrogate for the quality of the surgery, and a perioperative mortality of all the other, that's too much, even there, of 2%. That was probably among the very, very best results that have been published, which means that the fact that radiotherapy chemo and radical cystectomy fared equally well was not because one of the groups was suboptimal. Both were performing at the upper echelon, and again, supporting that it's a technique. It has nothing to do with the surgeons or the center. It's truly what you do that, that really matters. So, I just showed you that this is a large series showing equivalence in the absence of randomized study between the two technique. And it clearly supports that blood preservation should be offered to all candidates, not only patients who are not good surgical candidates with, for blood preservation. However, and I insisted and I, and, and I outline it here in red, this study does not support that radical cystectomy is not a good option. I showed you the outcome. It's an excellent option. It only shows you that it's not the only option. And for many, many patients, you should be in a situation in 2024 where you have to be able to discuss various options, not one single option, just because that's the one which is available somewhere. Now, how much can we put the envelope? I showed you that our criteria are one single tumor, less than seven centimeters. Now, the Brits have been doing things slightly differently, and they have been more, less stringent on their included criteria, including patients with larger tumor, not necessarily fully receptive, and so forth. We're, and I find that they do a great job. But when I look at the muscle invasive and the overall survival of five years, it is honestly and respectfully nowhere near where we can show it. And so we're still limiting our, our indications. We're gonna to try to see what's the next frontier. With Carla and Mar Maria, what we do sometimes now, but it's not part of that study. Patients come, they have a large tumor, they start with what we call neoadjuvant chemotherapy, fighting the enemy that you see, but the one that you don't see. And if absolutely all the stars get to line, everything melts like snow under the sun, and everything disappears, that's when sometimes we discuss viral preservation with the limitation that even in that setting, we are lacking a little bit some hard data. We can look into it to see whether it's good beyond our impression. So, to be as open in terms of inclusion as the Brits, I really don't think we're going to be. For no positive disease, again, many groups have published that. Look at the curves with 25, 30%. I, many of us are not completely buying into it. We, we still, I think we can have a discussion. We still think that these data, data are a little bit disappointing. And so we still stick to stringent criteria unless people are part of studies. The future is actually not even to remove or irrigate the wild, right? You give a drug, everything disappears, and then you sit, you make sure that there's no recurrence, and you sit. 
that was a little bit wishful thinking, but with new treatments, I'm sure Cala will, will tell you much more about exciting new avenues and, and really effective treatments. We have seen the number of people who have a tumor in place in the bladder, we see systemic treatment and where the entire tumor completely melts. That's what we call complete response. And responses are varying, goes in between 40% to 25, 30%. And so the question, which is completely legit, is you got a tumor, you got the treatment, everything disappeared. Why do I have to have my bladder removed? Why can't I have my bladder and keep it? It would be nice if it was that easy. Part of the equation can be driven by the genetic makeup of tumors. And some, and I'll spare you some of those genes, were good marker telling whether people will respond to the systemic therapy. And although that's a slide by Bessie Klimak, uh, initially we th th thought that some genes will predict at 100% who is responding and not responding. Actually, it didn't really pan out that well in, in validation study. But one study that truly really changed things was the one published by Matkowski a couple of months ago. And where they, what they did was they gave gemcitabine and cisplatin, and anyone who has had liver muscle invasive bladder cancer or many study will have received genocide and cisplatin. And they added as well the new immune checkpoints, the new immunotherapy, which is the involumab. And what they did, they did a study where they started by scraping the tumor, gave the genocide and cisplatin, gave the needle, and then reassessed. And to reassess, they went back into the cysto, they did biopsies, they did MRI, they did the cytology, they did everything that we we can rely on in 2024 to make sure there's no recurrence. And then they offer the choice to patients to either monitor if they had a complete response, so you do strictly nothing and you continue, but they would continue to receive the needle, which is the adjuvant in the therapy, or if they had no complete response, basically then that would prompt the blood removal as standard care. That's the patient characteristic, nothing really abnormal in those 70 patients. Same distribution between men and women, same age. Most of them had the classical urethral cancer. And right off the bat, you see that there was roughly more patients without complete response than those with complete response, although it was nearly great even. And even among those who had the complete response, one chose to have a his or her suspecting rather than carry the risk of moving forward. Okay, so 43% achieved a complete response and all of these but one decided to monitor. So what happened? What happened is this. These are all the patients, every single blue line is a patient who had a complete response and has been monitored. And what you see is that basically all these patients are suspected, but you already talk about 43% of the injured cord, so it's a subset of the 43%. And even among those who have no occurrence, still some of them had a relapse, some unfortunately had a relapse at distance. So overall, only 34% of the patients who started retained their bladder without any recurrence and without having to have it removed. Now, it's the story of the glass half empty, half full. For many people, they would say, that's very, very helpful. At least we can now start offering bladder preservation without even giving radiation inhibition. Those who see this as half empty say, hey, we still have 66%. We still had some people who passed away, so we need to do better. Needing to do better is maybe using some of the new technologies like what we call CTDNA. These are part of the DNA of the tumor. And again, I won't really go too much into detail. These are dead tumors shedding away that you can track by um, 
different techniques in the bladder of human or systemically. And where in addition to the MR, in addition to the cytology, in addition to the biopsies, if patients have that circulating tumor load negative, that's likely to tell you that there's nothing circulating and these are likely to be the one that you can offer. That will require new studies in, in that setting. And so I will close by saying that we probably need more efficient um, treatments and I cannot imagine one single minute that Kala will not tell you about EV, the doting and fortimat that has completely, completely revolutionized the way that uh, we treat bladder cancer, which targets um, a ubiquitous receptor in bladder cancer, which has a sweet name of Nectin-4, N-E-C-T-I-N-4. If you are at dinner and want to impress people, nothing is so nice. It's just perfect. The nice thing, though, is that it's everywhere, and it can be targeted. And so there's currently an, a study where the patients have received a combination of Pembro and EV prior to cystectomy, we were part of that study. The study, the, the results are not there yet, but are potentially very promising. Moving the needle of people with complete response, hopefully above 50%, that would be amazing. And in a study where they only use before um, surgery to try to reduce the size of the tumor, uh, EV, they have actually 36% of complete response, which again is very, very promising, especially if you think that if you combine it with Pembro. And so I think we're a cusp of having a kind of a revolution where we move away from only chemotherapy in adjuvantry to neoadjuvant chemo plus maybe immuno or even first line we'll see EV and immuno. Gala, I'm sure, will tell us and where this may change the game. A lot of studies, including several we participated, are ongoing. Ongoing in patients before surgery, um, Gemsys, Gemsys, and Durva, Enerzyze, Keynote with Pembro, and even Volga, Durvalumab, and training in patients after in cystitis. So there's a lot of studies ongoing, and I'm actually pretty sure that things will change and the future is kind of bright. If we are able to shrink those tumors and have them disappear, probably we'll be able to, to, to achieve something. And so I tried to show you briefly that it's so great to see that we move from having to operate every single bladder to operate only a subset of them and offer that. These are the best candidates and I, I explain them to you. There's currently a widening um, inclusion of people with nodes, people with T1, but again, all of this requires very, very careful studies. I don't think they should be up and running before we have very carefully analyzed the data. And there's also a widening mechanism for blood preservation where you don't even give chemo, or you don't even give, sorry, radiation, or you don't even give any surgical treatment simply because people have responded. So I tried to briefly mention that the future is bright, much, much brighter than five years ago, much brighter than 10 years ago. We now truly really have, and I think we should be proud of having this study done here in Toronto in the leading, showing the equivalence between RC and TNT, opening up the space and moving the field forward. I wish I could tell you that no bladder has to be removed. Honestly, it was my dream when I started. We're not there yet, but slowly, slowly, we'll get it. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Dr. Zlata. Uh, anyone have any questions? And so, you had radiotherapy? Yeah. You had radiation? Yeah. And so you had the blood preservation? Yeah. So unfortunately, once you have had, that's why we need to do salvage cystectomies. Once you have received a limiting dose of radiation, usually about 55 grams, 
on the area, plus 45 on the west. This is just too much, and usually our radiation oncologists um, colleagues uh, shied away from giving more because the harm and the risk for the adjacent organs is just too high. And so the short answer, at extremely rare exception, I remember maybe one case, but then there was really, the short answer is unfortunately no. Thank you, Dr. So the way that we treat non-muscle invasive blood cancer is based on risk categories. We have low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. And this is based on the depth of invasion even in non-muscle, either limited to the line of TA or going to the second layer of T1, and whether the patients have low-grade disease, which I often call pussycats, or high-grade disease in types. Now, in low-grade disease and low-risk, most of the time we don't need to use PCG. And there are many other treatments which can be provided inside the bladder, usually local chemotherapies that are equally effective and not necessarily with different side effects. For intermediate risk disease, PCG, and certainly for high-risk disease, PCG has been since four decades the most effective treatment to reduce the recurrences and new progression. In intermediate with, with disease, uh, there's a little bit equipoise between intravesical chemo and BCG. Now, when people do not tolerate BCG with very severe side effects, there are other options, even when you have high risk disease. There is currently a randomized trial called BRIDGE, which is comparing BCG, the standard of care, with a combination of two intravesical drugs given inside the bladder, which are gemcitabine and docetaxel. And the reason I bring this is because gemcitabine and docetaxel had been reserved to men and women who had high-risk disease had a recurrence despite BCG and became what we call BCG and responsive. Here in this, in the case of, of your sister, it's likely that the tolerance is not very good, but at the end of the day, she, she's not able to tolerate the full dose of at high risk. And so the combination of gemcitabine and docetaxel has been so effective at people at preventing recurrence in patients who did not respond to BCG that the NIH decided to move first line compared to BCG. And in south of the border, we were blessed on from Canada. I, we didn't really have a lot of BCG shortages. I know that some centers had, but overall, I have to say that we, we really have been blessed. And as you know, there's now two types of, of BCG, one that the classical and, and, and another one um, by verity, so we have a little bit more access to BCG than maybe south of the border. But in in the US, when BCG was not available, a lot of people have received outside of the US attacks that have fallen. And so the short answer is yes, there are possible. 